Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Aura Bora. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have Chuck Carrington and Michael Lang. Just released a new movie, Cowboy Drifter. It's been out for a little while, I guess. Before we begin, let's tell people where they can find it. We usually end with this, but just for people to get a sense of where the movie actually is, where is it? Okay, because it's not quite out yet. We're in the process of, of releasing it to streaming services. We're going to have it on Amazon. We're going to have it on Peacock. And we're going to have it on Tubi in the next month. None of those platforms give us an exact date. Yep. But we are coming soon. It's, yeah, it's coming soon. Actually, if you go on Amazon now and you type in Cowboy Drifter, you'll get the one sheet for the film, you'll get the cast list, and you'll get the trailer for the film, which okay. is fabulous. It's a fabulous trailer. So okay. if you really want to check it out now, go 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 at least look at the trailer right on now Amazon. on Amazon. Yeah. All right. So the reason I want to have you guys on several. One, as an entrepreneur, uh, it's similar. I'm a de- real estate developer, entrepreneurship all around. Have an idea, create an idea, bring the right people together. There's money involved, and then there's execution. I've been always so curious about the movie making business, TV making business. And so we're going to get into it with you guys today. And so the first step, writing it, the idea of it. What was the idea, the inspiration? Uh, people haven't seen the movie. It's amazing. It's a really well done movie. Shot super, I, th- I think like it's, I'm not a big movie guy, TV guy, but I like the way this thing was shot, the cinematography of it. But what was the idea of, if, to give people a window into what is Cowboy Drifter? It's a great question because when I, when I first had an idea to write the script, uh, it had nothing to do with what you actually see in the and film. And you're not a writer. Just, you're just... I'm a writer-actor. Yeah. I've written several scripts. And we can talk you're about that. an excellent writer. Thank okay. you very much. I appreciate that. Wow. Originally, I wanted to write something for myself. So I wasn't going to give this script to Tom Cruise or to you know, Matthew McConaughey or any of those folks. If he did, it would be out in the movie theaters already, <laughs> by the way. Just saying. That's the part we're going to edit out right now. Yeah. You can. Actually, Paula Wagner, no, Tom, I, Tom Cruise's producer, did read the script uh, okay. one of the early iterations. But I wanted to write something for myself. And you know, I, I grew up in the South, so I'm attached to Southern themes. I love the idea of redemption. And I figured I'd, I'd write about it an old cowboy type character who played guitar and, and sang on stage and something happened to him that he had to redeem himself for it. That was the original idea. And there was a Hank Williams senior sort of theme floating around in my head. I'm a big Hank Williams senior fan and follow his story. It's, it's pretty amazing. And then I realized I can't play guitar hmm. and I really can't sing. So let's figure this out. <laughs> so I had to, I had to go back to square one okay. and I just came That's up. actually funny knowing that I've seen the movie. That's, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. It makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And okay. the irony is that my father in the film yeah. character, he actually, he does all the singing and right. guitar playing and he's the white Buffalo in the film. By the he's, way, he's fantastic. He's amazing. Fantastic. He's musician. amazing. So yeah. we accomplished at least some of my original idea. Yeah. So then I sat down to write a story about redemption and any good piece of art has to do with conflict. And in this story, it's a conflict between a father and a son, even though the father's not there. That and sort of flesh that out and, and really dig into that. And I mean, you realize I don't, I don't want to give anything away in the film, but sure. it becomes not about father and son. Certain events happen and it becomes about this man, Caskey Jones, is my character, having to, uh, to figure things out for himself, having to change his life, uh, not for, just for himself, but for other people. And that's the redemption that comes in. And when you started writing this concept, how much time do you give yourself? Are you like, cause some writers, you know, we have some friends that are writers, they'll sit with it for a while, years, they hold on to it. They say it's not the right time. It's not the right time in history or culture or whatever it might be. Do you give yourself like a set timeline of saying, okay, I'm going to spend a year writing this and then I'll try to find a Michael. How long did you It's a good question. I wrote it in spurts. So okay. I, would, I would write pieces of it and then I would put it down because I didn't have to finish time because right. I knew I was going to do this all on my own. You talk about entrepreneurship. Yeah. This is what Cowboy Drifter is. I mean, it's starting from scratch and, you know, getting the pieces together as you go. So I had time to tell the story. So some days I'd literally be driving down the road and I, a scene would come into my head, the dialogue, and I would go home and I, I'd, I'd find the script and I'd, I'd sit back down and I'd start writing again. I mean, I can't tell you how long it took me to write this script, but it, it's, it took several years. And it's, I wouldn't call it a passion project. You, know, you hear that word a lot in Hollywood, you know, so-and-so has a passion project. To me, a passion project is, you know, someone sits down to write, but it's not really, you know, he may or may not get it done, finish the project. And I knew we were going to shoot this film. I knew I was going to get it done. I knew I was going to raise the money. I knew I was going to finish the script and get people attached. It would help me see it through. And then at what point do you go, all right, I think it's ready and then how do you decide how much money you need? 
Uh, yeah. Like how, how does that work? The whole money side of it? Well, th- to the first part of the question, it's the script is never ready. Right. Right. There's a lot of notes that go back. I and mean, forth, it's just even never ready in, shooting, until right? you shoot. And yeah. then sometimes you shoot and people ad lib and there's no ad lib in my script on this and this Michael saw to that. No one ad lib, but you know, it, it's never ready until, until the day comes and, and you put it on film and then you can't go back. Okay. The raising the money was, was the, was the hardest part for me. How do you figure out how much money you have to raise? How does that work? You know, you raise as much money as you can. And then if you, you find out you don't have enough, you try to go back and raise more. You know, I assume you never have enough. You never have enough. Yeah. An independent film is, is, is just, just that. It's just no one knows. You, just, you, you, you raise as much as you can. You hope for the best. And we use every nickel of, this, yeah. of the budget on this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And at some point, you guys have to figure out like how many people to hire the set. And so does the money dictate how much time you have to shoot and then who can be associated with the film? Yeah, you want to definitely you okay. want to answer that. I mean, the money basically. I mean, what he said is totally true. You never have enough money. However, I must say that I think some of the best work I've ever done in my career is when someone said you can't have that, mm. and then I have to figure out what's a creative way of getting the same thing that I wanted, okay, but without the money or a piece of equipment that I needed to get what I wanted. Yeah, I'll give you one example in the yeah. movie. It opens on a close-up of him, of Kasky, of course, and it's uh, he's looking. Can tell me if I'm misremembering this, but I think it opens on a close-up of you, and there's like yeah. a fur effect in his face. Yeah. yeah, and then you cut around to the other side, and his house is on fire. So obviously, we did not have enough money to burn down a house. Okay, I don't know if you ever ever know. Oh, I mean, big movies they do. But. Sure. So sure. I had to figure how do we make it look like the house is burning down? How'd you do that? Well, never mind. Movie is, magic. No, movie magic. Truly. So you make like no. a little house, like a little popsicle no, house? We did. And well, then you I light that ex- on fire? Is it no, CGI? Well, we did. Actually, This later, is where my mind goes. Later, I'm just curious. Movie, I don't want to give sure. anything away, but later we did do a little house. Too, okay. Because he burns down another thing. Yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah, he's a bit of a pyromaniac in the film. He's a pyromaniac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. we never really explain in the movie, which is fine. You don't have to. We yeah. didn't yeah. have to. Sure. But it, anyway, it's so also a, it's symbolic. Is, I think the, the yeah. yeah, it's more of it's a symbolic. symbolism than anything else that's, in the movie. That's what I'm going to go with in our next festival. Yeah. Yeah. As a writer, one. that's what I'm going with yeah. too. Yeah, that's, that's right. what I saw. That's, that was my take. It is absolutely. Symbolism. So basically, the way we did the first one was we had fire bars, you know, which are with gas in them that burn, and you. I used a very mm. long lens so that compresses the image. Yeah. So I had him at a certain distance away from the fire bars and then the house behind that. So everything looks like it's way closer really to the is. That's pretty smart. So the fire bars are filling the frame with fire. Yeah. And our brains assume that the house must be on fire because what else would be burning? Yeah. So wow. he's in the foreground, big close up. And mainly the, the, the idea is, you know, you're looking at him, really. Sure. But, I mean, the shot that tied everything together was when you were driving away. Right. And Let's do this. Give, give people a window shot. into the amount of things you've been involved in the professionally. Yeah. Oh, boy. Give it makes some me quick tired, names. Though. Quick names. Oh, so people know that you're. You uh, know. Criminal sure. Minds, Bones, X Files, Northern Exposure, a show called Greek, which was about college kids. A successful New Yorker in LA. Exactly. Boom, here you are. And so, it's hard not to be successful <laughs> here when you're from New York. <laughs> That's right. Because. You can throw Massachusetts. The in people there. here are just, you know, slower. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that they're slower. They're laid right. back. They're laid back. Just like in the Woody Allen back. movie. If we went to Jamaica, it'd be the same thing. Be the same thing. Right. I've been, I've shot in Jamaica. See, that was a nightmare. Okay. So when I think about having watched the movie, all the people that you guys were able to ensemble as part of the cast, I mean, tremendous. Tremendous, that was tremendous that musical was all talent. Him. That was all Tremendous show. musical talent. And yeah. so like the movie, from my perspective, can be entertaining purely on the music front. Right. And then there's the other side of it of like the storytelling. Both great. So you got all those people involved prior to Michael getting on board, or how does that operate? I mean, it's all one big stew, and you okay. you, right. you continue to stir it in however direction you can. And are you selling them a dream, coming. or are you? Because with a small budget, it's also difficult, I imagine. All the music drops came through a music supervisor, and okay. I would okay them or not, basically in charge of the music. And I said, yes, I like this song. Does this person, does this artist, Shaky Grays, for example, he he's, has a song in the film. He's fantastic. The song that was presented to me, I didn't lo- love as much as the one I clicked on next. And I said, this is the one we need to put in the film. We need to go get this. 
And we had a budget for music, and we were very lucky. We got the Revivalists, for goodness sake. I mean, yeah. one of the hottest bands around. The music's fantastic. The music's yeah. fantastic. I mean, music. Really fantastic. And it really, I think it helps to tell the story of the movie, too. It's not just music for the sake of music. And then what's the woman's name, the singer, like the main singer? Aubrey the, the Peoples. Female. She's great. She's Audrey fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Aubrey. Yeah, she was in Nashville. She did the show Nashville, 65 episodes. Unbelievable voice. She was, she was, amazing. she had such a, an amazing voice in that, on that TV show yeah. that they had to stop letting her sing because she wasn't one of the main principals. Oh, she was wow. a recurring character. But when wow. she came to us and, and she sang these songs and I got to listen to her in the recording studio in New Mexico, I mean, mm -hmm. I had tears in my eyes. Yeah. She, she didn't have she's, to act that part. She's She's yeah. incredible. I mean, she is amazing. Oh, she was amazing. It's funny. I think like when I think about myself as a, as a business mind entrepreneur, I have friends of mine who are musicians and some of them, when they do sing, I'll like find myself going to this deeply emotional place. Right. Yeah. And it, and I'm like, why am I like, I'm like, I'm in conflict with myself as to like, oh my God, I am a human. Right. And when I heard her, I knew immediately, I was like, she's one of those people you see live, it moves you. Yeah. As the entrepreneur, I mean, I, I need things to go right. I yeah. need to assemble a cast, a group of people who are going right. to make this task work. Yeah. And listening to her sing as a producer, not just the actor, but as the producer, I say, this is gold. Yeah. This, this is money. We're going to put her on, on camera singing as, as much as possible. Smart. And I actually wrote, uh, co-wrote one of the songs for her that she sings in the film. Look at you. Yeah. Musical credit. Already Gone. That's the song that she sings that I said, we need a song for her. No one has, a, has the right song for her. This is what we need, to, we need to write for Aubrey. She's a teenager. She's living in New Mexico in a crappy part of town, mm -hmm. right? She's older than her years. She wants to sing. She wants to get out and fly. And yeah. she can't do it because she's under the control of her mother. And she wants to, she wants to leave. So she's basically already gone right. in her mind. Interesting. And yeah. I sent this email to my music supervisor, and he took that, and we basically wrote the song Already Gone based wow. on that conversation, that email. Yeah. How many things do you have to do when it comes to getting things ready before you hit like the start date on, okay, we're starting to shoot? Like, what is that like? Is that just a simple version of you guys set a date? We set the date, and, and then, then you work sort of. You assemble okay. the, the project as, as best you can, and then you hope that Monday morning, you're going to be ready to go. Our okay. problem was Monday morning, we didn't have an actor to play the mortician. And here it was Saturday in New Mexico. You got we're, a good one. We're sitting in an office and Chelsea Ross is presented to me. And I say, this is great. And one of our producers who's no longer with us, he said, well, he wants, He's not he, dead. he wants to, <laughs> He's with us, he, he, he was not excommunicated. Chelsea wants a first class flight from Chicago to New Mexico. By the way, there's no direct route to get to New Mexico. So yeah, I was going to say, how yeah. do you do that? You, I mean, you put him in a black Uber? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I said, how much is he? He said, $1,700. We, we don't have $1,700. So it took me about 30 seconds. I, I paced up and down the hall, and I say, this is, we have to have Chelsea Ross. He's one of the greatest character actors. Sure. If you don't know him from Hoosiers, you know, all kinds of Major films. League. Rudy, you name it. Yeah. Um, Major League, he's phenomenal. So I said, we have to have Chelsea Ross to do this role because he's perfect for it. So I came back to the producer and I said, well, I'll, I'll pay for it. Just take it out of my check. Nice. I didn't have a great check to begin with. It didn't matter. We had sure. to have Chelsea. Sure. So he shows up Sunday, Monday morning. He, he, he nails every shot he's in. Oh, he works for two days. He's fantastic. Wow. There's no film if there's no, if there's no Chelsea Ross That's in my amazing. mind. How many people do you guys have as a whole team, like on set? You're filming in New Mexico. How many people are there? At least 50. I mean, it depends on the day. But people are running about in every direction. Sure. I'm the actor, but I'm also the producer. It's so... I'm trying to juggle things, you know, as I'm acting, as I'm coming off camera, I'm getting, you know, told certain things that we don't have or certain things we need. Sure, sure. Getting questions that I'm, I'm trying to prepare for the next shot, but yet I'm, I put on my producer. It's, it's tough, but I was, I was prepared. So. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. When it comes to real estate development, it's actually very similar. It's like you never really have anything and you're always missing things or in search of something. And it probably you, is you just live in that You live in that balance and money can save you for sure. But I think sometimes what you said before, like getting scrappy about solving problems yeah. actually leads to a better product for you. So you, you come from the television world. One, what was attracting, uh, attractive to this project for you? And then what made you want to do a movie? Or well, a I mean, movie? you know, I think TV directors until they get along in their further along in their career, always want to do, it seems like TV is sort of the second choice. Okay. You really want to do features because in a feature film, the director has a lot more creative control, okay. theoretically. 
I've now come to the conclusion that TV was perfect for me because it has the infrastructure already there and all you have to do as a director is direct, which is what I love to do the most. I don't Got like, it. like I would be a horrible entrepreneur because I don't have the patience <laughs> to fail. I think that means you're smarter than us. That's it, not necessarily, <laughs> but I mean, I think when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to have the patience to continue to fail until you succeed. Oh uh, yeah, it's awful. Whereas I like to go in, everything's there. I say action, something happens. Yeah. In, a, in an independent movie, that is not the case. I say action, but no one else is there. <laughs> but what attracted I you? I have to do it. What attracted, so what attracted you to me to this <laughs> was, we want it's to really about the script. <laughs> okay. So I, I get a call from my agent. Yeah. There's this indie movie and they would like to talk to you. So I said, okay, I'll read the script. I read the script. I loved the script. So it's really, for me, it's about, it's either if it's a gigantic check and the script sucks, I'll do it. Right. Right. But if it's, a great Smart script. Guy. Yeah. I don't care about the check. I That's didn't awesome. care. Which is good because we yeah. didn't really give them they a check. They didn't really have a big check. Yeah. You know, the script was amazing. And I just, I totally, I, I mean, I didn't identify because I'm nothing like Caskey Jones and I've never been like Caskey Jones, but I just loved, you know, everything about the script. The dialogue was fantastic. The characters were rich, developed and interesting. And the situation was, it was, it had a nice drive to the story but it wasn't like stoop insane, you know. Sure, sure. It wasn't like just for the sake of driving. At it what had point, a meaning. Something it. that I've always thought about is obviously you guys have to go through proper channels. The agents go back and forth. At what point do you two actually chat? Like when when do the agents finally allow the creators to actually have a discussion? Well, early on. Yeah, it was yeah. Early. Okay. Basically, this, also there was a time frame on this that was pretty tight. Yeah, yeah. they we, were already committed to. We were six stage. weeks before you know, right. we were going to shoot, and we didn't we didn't have a choice because we were coming up against holidays and things like that. We had we had a finite amount of time. We had to hit that amount of time. But his agent got in touch with our producer, and he said, "Yes, Michael wants to meet with you." So I, I met with the producer with Michael and two other qualified candidates to direct the film, and I looked up Michael's uh, credits ahead of time, of course, and. <laughs> When I looked on IMDb and, it, and the page kept scrolling and yeah, scrolling and <laughs> scrolling, and you see 260 plus episodes of television, and you look at all the television shows that he's done that he that he named off of just phenomenal shows. Yeah. It's like if this guy wants to meet, it's like I'm going to say yes unless he's a complete jackass, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he he came in, we sat down. And he's, I mean, it was phenomenal. It was it was easy right from the from the get go. And Michael, how many scripts do you see? Would you say over Feature the course scripts, of like, you mean? yeah, over the course, or how many, how many things does your agent send you that you have to rifle through on either uh, a daily or monthly basis during the heyday during the heyday? Oh my God. I've had a heyday now. <laughs> it sounds so old. Um, you know, probably thousands. When you wow. never stop working for years. I never stop working. working. Yeah. I mean, TV scripts, you know, sure. Hundreds and hundreds, and I mean, I can't know, tell you scripts. what a coup it was to get this. Game. Yeah, but here's so the thing, for you to be look, inspired by it or see something, I, I, and then I, he brings his DP that he's used on a lot of shows. And DP, as you said, the cinematography is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's Can phenomenal. I just go back though? I appreciate what he said about a coup. However, I think what I heard from my friend who recommended me, he said I gave them three names. I gave them two young, up and coming. Okay film directors and then i gave them European. your name yeah. so and and what i told them was if you want someone who's gonna do the best possible he's gonna make the best possible movie out of your material then go with michael because he's a tv director that's sure. what he's used to right a that tv may, director doesn't a huge amount of say on the material that's interesting so he said, if you want like someone to come in with their vision right. and maybe change your movie, then these other two guys might be okay, but it's not going to be as much your movie and it definitely won't be done on time and on budget. Yeah. So Michael would be, he'll That's make the best possible product from, out from of what you wrote. He'll stay, stay in the box, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that's true because yeah. I, I had one kind of semi big note about, you know, what I felt just in terms of the script needed mm -hmm. to start off with, which he liked, fortunately. That's what happens. You have a meeting, right? You sit down, and as soon as you start talking, you forget that he's directed 260 episodes of television. You just start talking about the script. Yeah. What do you think of the script? I mean, I'm completely open to creative suggestions. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we, he knows totally. that by now, but yeah. yeah. So he had, a, he had a huge note for me that I had rejected on many, many drafts, and that was 
putting Caskey's father in the film at the beginning so that we know who this tyrant, this person is. Yeah. And that makes the story so much better. And then you hire, you know, the white buffalo, Jake Smith, to play Caskey's father. And he's this giant, like Harley Davidson wearing long beard, you know, hat and the whole thing. He's perfect for yeah. it. So that note, if it wasn't sealed the deal, you know, before, hadn't been sealed before with Michael, yeah. that note, I, I literally went home and couldn't wait to get on the computer and start writing. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I and then two days later I said, Can we have lunch? And I, I took the pages. I took like six pages that I'd written in half an hour because I knew I knew what I had to write. And I gave it to him. We we're ordering sandwiches, and he's going over these six pages of the script. And, you know, he, he really, I think he was he was impressed that I, took, away. I took the note. But Blown away. he was also impressed awesome. with the pages that I gave. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. He, he made it a million times better than my note, wow. which is, of course, a nice part of the process. I like that. And what, what landed you guys in New Mexico? Of all the like, how, how does tax that incentive. process start? Okay, tax incentive. That's all a right. great question. Yeah, you, you can't shoot things in California because it's just too expensive. That's why like Boston is attractive now. I guess Massachusetts right. has yeah, some good are, tax incentives. Good. Yeah, it's twenty five um, cents on the dollar. So every dollar we spend, we get twenty five cents back. So that's, in New Mexico, in New Mexico, it's huge, and it wow. still exists. It's literally, today. they give you a quarter. It's weird. That's incredible. <laughs> it's it's why so many projects are filmed there. Breaking Bad was filmed there. Is that right? Breaking Bad. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the the uh, the scenery in New Mexico plays oh, it, a role it, as well. It, the music, the, the scenery in the background, it adds to it. You get the desolation of this place. Right. And is the expensive part like housing people or is it RVs, is it hotels? How do you do that? I think the expensive part is, you know, the, the cast requires, you know, no one's going to do it for free. And there's always right. haggling about that. And there's just a, a, a large you amount yourself? of people that it's you have to. You're the one negotiating it or is it agents? I'm ultimately the, the one that has the final say. Yeah. 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 I mean, if Michael's agent comes back and says, you know, he needs more money. I can say, I, this is what we have. Right. And, you know, or if an, an actor comes back and says, you know, she needs more money to play the role, it's like, well, we're going to have to get someone else because this is all we can afford. Oh, did you lose anybody because we of that? We didn't lose anyone. Okay. We didn't lose anyone. I think because here's the thing. It's the material. Yeah. The, the script is so good. Yeah. That the, for creative people, I'm going to include myself in that list, it's really about the, that's the part that, turns us on yeah. yeah Chelsea Ross literally said I mean I asked him I said why did you do this film it's only two days there's no money in it he said it was the script, <laughs> the he, script? Said, he said he said even my agent told me not to do this film oh, because wow. there's no money in it but he said I like the script so much that I wanted to do yeah. it and I you know I hug him every time I see him see yeah. what I love about that in entrepreneurship it's like at least for me so I, I get the question a lot when I talk to new entrepreneurs around you know why how, when they go raise money why do people give you money how do you do it and I always say for you as a new entrant into the business you're about to go and whether it's like CPG, whatever they're trying to do, let's say the sparkling water. If they're new, three reasons people give you money generally are you, your reputation and your product. And you're a new entrant, which means the you bucket is pretty low. The reputation is zero. And so it means you have to put all your energy into the product. And that's what people ultimately will invest in. It's in this setting when you're new, the you piece, like you in the sense of, I know he's new to it, but I think, or he or she, but I think he's going to, I think they're going to break down every wall to figure out every single problem. They seem committed. And yeah. then the product being, it's got to taste good or it's got to, it has to be solving some problem that is simple to identify. Yeah. Those are the two things that yeah. I think. And so it seems like obviously here you have the product, right? The script, the story, it's sold. The, diff the difference in our business is most people you're trying to get money from, you know, independently at least, mm -hmm. they don't know anything about making films. Right. They might, they would know a good script from a, of a lousy script. So what are they asking you? Are they like, how am I going to make money? What are the questions that people are asking you in, in the, while you're raising? Like you said, it's, it's, it's the you part for, for, sure. for me. Yeah. I, this is, we call it lawyers and dentists. Him. I mean, you, you're, you're literally asking money from family friends, yeah. from your own friends, from, from people you know, that you've met, that they have friends that yeah. might invest. You're doing a lot of digging to try to find the money. But I found it, at least for, for this project, that they believed in me. They believe I could get this done. They could see it in my eyes when I sat down with them. And I, I couldn't present them with, with a, a plan that I was going to say, hey, this, this is going to make you X, Y amount of money. And in fact, you might lose money. In fact, you probably will lose right. money because it's an independent film and it's a hard mm -hmm. day to make money from, through this process. But they believed in me. They believed in in the vision that I had, and and I, you know, I was That's able crazy. to sell. That's crazy. That's so cool. Yeah. And so for them, they're just they just want to see it come to life. They want to see it come to life. I guess is the payoff. 
Yeah. And there's yeah. a there's a mystique about you know being involved in a movie. Like yeah. some of them came to the set. There's a social capital component and, you to know, it. They right. get to yeah. sure. eventually gets on. You know, they'll get to have viewing parties with their friends and say, hey, I was an exec producer on that movie or I put money into it. Yeah, yeah. And that's amazing. That's a kick. For, you know, that's that's good. It is. Yeah, the social capital piece is real. Okay, and so then you guys wrap the movie. Marketing. How do you get out? How do you get the word out about the movie? How do you do that? <laughs> that's probably the hardest part. Yeah. 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 I mean, because, <laughs> that's the hardest part. Because there's so much After content, raising the money, which is the say, hardest part. There's no blueprint the for it. The there's, there's no blueprint. Okay. I mean, you, you yeah. hire a sales agent and you try to get them to try to to sell the movie on its own merits so before i can even you know try to get it on social media and try to talk to anyone about you know publicizing it on behalf of, of the two of us or the this, the cowboy drifter team you know we have to find a sales a sales group that'll that'll try to get out there and hoof it and try to get this in front of as many uh, distribution companies as possible okay and luckily we've come to the point where you know, we've got in front of three and they're, they've all said yes. And getting it on Amazon is fantastic. And, yeah. you know, Peacock is great. And there's thousands of movies on Tubi. Everybody goes to Tubi to look for films they can't see on other streaming services. So the platforms themselves are, you know, we're pretty lucky. And are you always selling in, in a sense? Like, are you just constantly going back to them saying like, hey, you should have this? Or like, what metrics do they look at? Or is it just based on like they the They have story? their own metrics. Yeah. So it's up to them. You show yeah. them your product. You know, they may or may not have a need for it. You know, this is a serious drama. It's pretty heavy. Do they have too many dramas already? You know, do they are they looking for more romantic comedies Oof, or what? So it's, it's, tough. it's, 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 <laughs> it's a miserable process trying to sell miserable. it. You know, and when then, you know you have a good product, <laughs> you should be buying this product. <laughs> I mean, ben it's there, not like ben if there. I wanted to make like a soft drink yeah. and if it tasted good and if the packaging was kind of cool and if I had the right marketing, it works. Yeah. But a movie, you don't really know. I mean, we, we, we could have the right marketing. It, it could be a great movie, which, you know, let's say this one is for sake of argument and you still, it may not work. In the world you live in, so in like the retailer in space, no. In, in, no, I just mean like in the TV world, yeah, right? in the retail space, Retailers look at the data and they'll say, it looks like people are looking for a better for you ice cream based on what we know. And so a retailer may approach an entrepreneur or a company to make that product. Is that how, is, is the TV world like that where they go, okay, we have a, a sense that people like crime. I don't know. Right. And I so mean, there are certain genres that always and, uh, sell. Crime is crime, one. Yep. I think medical shows go in and out, but they're pretty yep. legal shows. Vampire okay. things usually go in and out. So yes. Okay. Yes, that is. Because in my yes. head, I went to, what about Yellowstone? Yellowstone is such a, a banger of a hit, right? It's got some cowboy element to it. Is this a world where plug and play? It seems I, like an easy sell. That's just me I, thinking out loud I think right that, now. I think that's quite possible. I mean, okay. Yellowstone has brought the, you know, the cowboy right. back. The cowboy, you know, that, that, that the dramas. So perhaps, you know, other side of the table, they're going, yeah, we need more films like Yellowstone. Yeah, because there's data now to suggest that there's a lot more data. Crushing. Now. But then on the other side of that, some people are like, oh, it's just a copy of Yellowstone. And right. then sure. that's a negative. Although the truth, of, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, Cowboy Drifter, you know, Caskey Jones is neither a cowboy nor is he a drifter. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, can you talk about other names that you considered well, I, for the movie? I've found, at least for me, when I write a script, I either the, the title comes right away, you know exactly what it's going to be, or you're, you're, you write the script and it'll come at some point. So Cowboy Drifter, the film comes into the latter category. It came at some point. And that's when, you know, I, I said, I mentioned Hank Williams Sr. I was a fan of his music and his, his story, his life. The name of Hank Williams Sr.'s backup band was called the Cowboy Drifting Band. And mm. once I read that, mm. I said, this is it. It's, I'm just going to make it concise. Cowboy Drifter. And at first I had the Cowboy Drifter and I gave the script to a friend. It was much like Facebook. You know, when, when yeah. Zuckerberg first came out with Facebook, it was the Facebook. Right. I gave it to a friend of mine. His only note was, take out the the. <laughs> just make it Cowboy Drifter. That's and it's just, funny. it's a great title. And I actually make fun of that he's a cowboy in, in the film. The person he meets along his journey, he's, she keeps calling him Cowboy and he yeah. keeps saying, I'm not a cowboy, don't call me that. That's right. Yeah, so. Do you guys have a favorite scene? Favorite scene. I'm not ever good on the favorite thing, like favorite color, favorite scene. Or how favorite about something where there's a story, like something stands out, something didn't go right, something went wrong, you had to figure it out. The, the fire oh, one's hell. interesting, right? This is a five-hour podcast because yeah. I can easily talk about what went wrong <laughs> every single day. Give people a small window into things that aren't, aren't going smoothly. 
It's tough. Let's just say that things went wrong every day and we <laughs> solved them. Every day Actually, is an adventure. Actually, the best, kind of the best, the one we can talk about the most is on day five at lunch, there was, the crew went out on strike because they had signed up. They had all, it was originally a non-union show. This producer who shall go nameless, however he is in the credits, if anyone wants to look at his name, decided to play hardball with the union. He was given misinformation about a right to work state and the crew, the union came to try to, what's it called? Sign everyone up. There's a word for it, but okay. they Recruit. ended up signing up and the, the producer decided, you know, screw the union. Oh my God. And which I kept saying, this is not a good idea because this is the IA, which is a big, you know, it's a big international or a big union right. and you really should make a deal with them. It's, you're not going to win a war with them. Yeah. So on day five at lunch, we had 18 days, which is why I say we had 17 and a half, because on day five at lunch, the crew left on strike. Someone, someone from, <laughs> from the union literally comes to the set and whistles and, and ushers everyone off the set. Right. So we're having lunch with the cinematographer, Jules Abarth. He's literally sitting across where you are now. And he saw and he heard the whistle and he, and he put his tray down and he got up and he walked out. Not a word spoken. What? Yeah. So we had to negotiate. Not only did we have to afternoon. negotiate, but we also had to load all the equipment into the back end of the trucks because they literally they just left walked everything. off without, yeah. Day five, Jules was about to fly back to L.A. Right. So what is this negotiation like? It's pretty short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They slip you a piece of paper and they okay. say, this is what we want. And you, you, you read it, you, you scribble back, and then you agree. And what are the, it's what's on, give what people a window onto things on this list. Is uh, it like I'll bathroom you, breaks, it's a sh food? It's a short, it's a short, it's window, a short window with money. only a dollar sign on it. And they said they take the money and put it in their pension fund, which is fantastic. I hope they use it well with the, the, uh, the crew so you have to do it. in New you're, Mexico. You're, we did. So we part did. of our budget was spent on you're being shaken. getting the crew back. Shaken down, as they say. Yeah, I mean, depending you know, on who you talk to. It depends on who you talk to. And then everyone, okay. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so you have a bunch of people to work. who defect. That, I would take that personally. The union, the, the, that's what then, they have to then do. Then they come back. Right. And it's all kumbaya. Absolutely. It's kumbaya. Absolutely. And they were so happy. I mean, what? to they, come back. To come back and also to be in the union. But the New Yorker in you wants to kill them. Come on. The upside was, so that, the upside, <laughs> I think, in the end, some of the non-union people that worked on our in our crew oh became God. union. Yeah. And so they were subject really great to better careers. benefits, benefits got it, got all it. that. So yeah. they were recruited. It worked out for the best. It, it was out. for the best. Yeah. I did have to rewrite part of the script based on losing that half a day. But, you know, that's that's part of the job. Yeah, we took out one thing, which wasn't really... A, we that's made it work. It was not insane. a big... Yeah. We made it work. That sounds so crazy. It was crazy. From an entrepreneurship it was crazy. perspective. Can I talk about the... It wasn't quite as easy as that. There was a meeting on Saturday. This was on a Friday. Yeah. So then Saturday we had a meeting at the production office. And the producer... It was an 11 o'clock meeting. Yeah. I came into the office at 10.30 because I always get there a half hour early. Yeah. And Humble at 11.05 I look at my watch <laughs> and no one's called me into the meeting. So I go to the production coordinator i say oh, is the meeting started oh yeah they started at 11 I went, hmm. okay so i think they didn't want me in the meeting you know the producer yeah. didn't want me this was a different in producer entirely i just no not that. not yeah. chuck this yeah. is the what's called the line producer the yeah. line producer wow so i go in i say hey and i you know i decide okay i'm not gonna say what the you know why so i just go and sit down what's going on so we've decided we're gonna this is the producer the other producer not the chuck chuck was sort of observing and i think i know where he would have eventually come down because he did eventually yeah so the Quickly. he says um we've decided we're gonna go non-union screw the union we're gonna go non-union so i said i don't think that's a very good idea sure. <laughs> because sure. already the crew is not very good and now we're gonna get worse people and we're gonna be picketed yeah. and we're gonna not get permits and the police are gonna the, the teams you know the drivers are gonna picket us yeah and then he said, well, we'll just keep the call sheet secret. He literally said that. I went, I laughed because, you Can't know, do that, yeah. right. We're, we're going to keep the call sheet secret. So I said, well, here's the thing. I did this because it's an amazing script and I think we can have a beautiful movie out of it. Obviously, I didn't do it for the money because what I make in two days shooting is what I'm making on this. I'm exaggerating somewhat, sure. but... Well, when you count residuals, bro. Anyway, um, so I said, so 
I am not interested. So not only are you going to have to find a new crew, you're going to probably have to find a new director. So then I asked what it was, what was the amount of money that it was going to take to make it work with the union, and they told me. And I said, so for that amount of money, like we're going to shut down for two weeks in order to find a whole new crew, a significantly worse movie. Got it. Got and it. I think just pay the money. Got it. And when that happens, do you have you have to pay it immediately, or how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Paid immediately. We were lucky it was a Friday, not a Tuesday. Yeah, that's right. Because we did have the weekend to at least discuss the money. amongst ourselves. So that was nice. But it was it was literally <laughs> it was every day something came up. Yeah. But you know you're used to it. You, your working day never it never so this starts is and it this never is a ends. Normal. It's, it's normal. It's a normal but, I mean, process. Yeah. In, in when you build a house, isn't it the same thing? Every day something goes wrong. Yeah. So so in development in real estate development, yeah, for sure. When things go wrong, I mean, when you don't get a call, something is not working well you're worried right exactly. i'll put it to you like that and so problems become opportunities that right. you expect them same thing with us that problem though of someone shut like people walking off i've not right. i don't think i'll ever deal with that that's right hope not that's yeah i hope not either that's but pretty i wild. think to be like i think chuck would probably agree with this too there's a part of me anyway i'm not going to speak for chuck that when things go that wrong yeah. i like it because it forces me to really come up with my problem solving. Yeah. It like makes me notch my problem it gets solving you sharper. up to 12. Totally. You know. Totally. I don't like I it because that. I'm in charge of the whole <laughs> right. process. Right. He doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah. If, it's good, if it could go wrong to the point where we're going to get shut down completely, it's obviously I'm the one who loses the most. That's a great story, though. I so, appreciate you yeah. sharing that. Yeah. When it comes to film festivals, awards, how does that whole game work? Yeah, we've done a few film festivals. It's great. We did a, a couple in New Mexico, one in Chicago. We did one in Marina del Rey. It's just nice for the exposure to get the film out, get okay. people to... It, and do you have to pay to be at those? No. No, 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 no. Okay. no. They, you get invited? You get invited. Okay. Yeah. They have to screen the film and decide whether or not they want us. And we've been we've been pretty lucky. There's right. one in Park City, Utah, right? I've heard about the one in Park City. That's where yeah, they shoot Yellowstone also. What's that called? How awesome. It's called the Sundown? Oh, sun, Sundown sun, Festival. Sun, yeah. Wait, no, the dance... Sundance. Dancing in the sun. Sundance. <laughs> Sundance has kind of gone in a different direction in terms of what they want for yeah. films. And Cowboy Drifter, you know, Redemption piece. I thought that would have uh, been perfect. Didn't, uh, you would think. It would have been like with the 15 years ago. Would have okay. Been so probably not now. Perfect. That's a bummer. So you ask initially, you know, when you, how do you determine when you make a film, for what audience you make a film, that sort of thing. You know, we, I didn't exactly make this film at the right time in history. There's so many, there's a wider array of films being made now. Okay. Um, than there used to be, and this 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 kind of redemption piece film used to fit in into a, a little box, and people really loved the box, what was inside the box. And then you know things sort of changed, and there was uh, for a good way. I mean, you could see whatever you want now. But to your point, I think when Yellowstone came back, people realized that oh yeah, these kind of like Western, uh, yeah. you know, guy trying to do the best he can for his family sort of thing. These these films, let's not forget about these because there's a reason people enjoy them in the first place. And for me, you know, if I, my hero is Paul Newman. Yeah. Every Paul Newman film, more or less, was about redemption. It was about you know. You know, can this guy overcome these obstacles in order to get his character or, you know, to get to a certain place in his life? And those those were the films that inspired me. Yeah. And so I wanted to, uh, Cowboy Drifter sort of as a, as a throwback film to right. to some of the old Paul, Paul Newman films. And yeah. we discussed that when we were prepping the movie. And it was certainly, that was sort of the feel that we wanted to go for. It was certainly a part of my writing. I felt that way. Yeah. It yeah. hits. What, Always what in the it, back of my head. What are your greatest desires for this? Like, what do you want people to take away from both this interview, but also from from what you guys created. I want people to see it, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you talk about startup to storefront. We're, we're at the point now, where we're at storefront yeah. with, with this project. And we're, for the amount of money, the little amount of money we spent, what we were able to do with this film, who we were able to, luckily, to get to, to be in the film, to be, you know, working on the film, we couldn't be more proud. Yeah. So yeah. first and foremost, we want, we want eyeballs on the film. And if they like the film, they don't like the film, it's totally up to them. I mean, yeah. my, our job is done. So we want people to watch, and we like the, you know, the greatest, uh, widest audience possible. And I've been, you know, we, we did these film festivals, like you mentioned, and I had women from France come up to me and want to talk to me about the film. I had young kids. I had, you know, older adults. I, I was amazed that it, yeah. it sort of struck people differently but th all walks of life mm -hmm. and, and that really made me happy as we embark on this social media campaign for this I'm, I'm excited to see what that does because it's, it's been able to change businesses it's been able to change people's lives we've had a number of those people on our podcast 
with TikTok and the Instagram. And so right. it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah, this is a very um, niche kind of film totally. too. So it's not easy to market. So it's we'll, almost we'll a good thing can. though. It's like own your niche, plant your flag. Right. And the, I think the film makes it easy in terms of owning the niche. Right. Yeah. Cause there's nothing people could say, Oh, this is just like per se. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Not today. Not on TikTok. If the film does really well, I might grow the beard out again. <laughs> just in How long did that take you to grow up? Six months. Six months. You six didn't months, shave for six didn't months. Didn't shave one time. I scared more <laughs> I just people walking thought. around the streets of Hollywood than you could uh, ever imagine. Yeah. So the union comes to shake you down and you're looking the, with that crazy beard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're not scared of you. They're like, sign this check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I felt powerless, but we did what we had to do. So, oh, And they did too. God. Yeah. It is the way it is. Yeah. When did you finish shooting the movie? Um, we finished before COVID. So, yeah. Before, before COVID. COVID. Okay. Yeah. The year okay. before COVID. We kept it on the shelf for a while. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I mean, we had to. Anything else people should know? Go check out the trailer on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. check out the trailer. Type Absolutely. in Cowboy Drift. Uh, it's a, a great look. film. It's a great Believe film. Believe me, I have a good perspective on my work. Not, I've done a, a bunch of stuff that's not so great. I'm so proud of this movie. You know, I can't say enough yeah. how proud of it I am. Every it's a great aspect. movie. I love the cinematography. Yeah, the story's you. amazing. The music's amazing. Uh, checks a lot of boxes. Kudos to you guys for putting this together. Kudos to you, Chuck. Thanks thank for you, coming Daniel. on. Appreciate it. Yeah, nice. appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.